I'm thrilled to be here today with uh, these stellar panelists to moderate a discussion on harnessing data and lived experiences for safe streets. My name is Ashton Romer, and I'm a PhD candidate in my third year uh, in a PhD program at George Mason University. I'm an urban planner by training, but have wiggled my way into a peace and conflict resolution program. Now, most folks think that I am studying civil wars and climate refugees in some country far, far away. You can imagine how much less eager people are to talk to me at dinner parties when I tell them that I'm researching vehicular violence and car supremacy. Um, before they dart away, I try to squeeze in a parting remark about how I'm more motivated actually by the possibilities that lie within reframing our streets and the potential for peace uh, that we might see. So you can imagine my delight when I was invited to moderate this panel, given that it speaks to an issue that I spend most of my waking hours puzzling through and advocating for. I live in DC um, and care a lot about what happens in this city as do many of my um, panelists here today. If you attended this morning's keynote with Mr. Brown, you have a sense of the contours of the issue that we'll be talking about today. But to add a bit more context, around the world, more than one million people die on roads due to car crashes annually. Uh, in the US, that average uh, averages more than 40,000 a year. Um, that includes a really concerning increase in pedestrian and bicyclist fatalities. Now, this 40,000 uh, per year number tends to run neck and neck with the number of people that we lose to gun violence. And we talk about gun violence as a public health epidemic, but we don't really tend to do so, at least in mainstream discourses. Um, beyond the tragic loss of life, we also have to reckon with the millions of injuries that car crash survivors um, contend with, sometimes for the rest of their lives. We must bear witness to the trauma that stays with people impacted by car crashes, and we need to hold space for the real mental health impacts that people unprotected by cars grapple with whenever they set out onto our streets. Um, particularly when they are inadvertently or sometimes purposely subjected to close, cars, uh, close calls with inherently dangerous vehicles. For that reason, it is so important to have the voices of our panelists today so that we can flesh out the challenges and opportunities around gathering data to make our streets safe and using storytelling about lived experiences to motivate action. So with that, um, I'd like to turn to our panelists, give them each a couple of minutes to introduce themselves and their connection to the panel topic. Uh, as you may have read about in the agenda, there's an exciting partnership uh, with Howard University, unfortunately, um, uh, Dr. Arhan wasn't able to join us due to last minute um, something something that came up. And so um, instead, maybe what I'll do is turn to Jeremiah to introduce himself and some of the work that he's doing and maybe highlight that particular program a little bit too. Awesome. Can folks hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, I was going to say, is this thing on? Um, how's it going? I'm Jeremiah Lowry. I'm the uh, advocacy director at the Washington Area Bicycles Association. Uh, we work throughout the uh, Maryland worked in, uh, sorry, Montgomery County in Maryland, Prince George's County uh, in Maryland, uh, Washington, D.C., uh, and Northern Virginia as well. Uh, we have um, a youth education and adult education, uh, learn to ride classes, so we teach people uh, how to ride bikes uh, for free. Uh, we have a trail rangers program where we uh, clean uh, and uh, monitor the uh, trails in Washington, uh, D.C., uh, and then we have a Vision Zero program where we have uh, a youth leadership institute uh, in uh, Maryland, and um, uh, Prince George's County and Washington, D.C., uh, including a Youth Vision Zero Summit. Uh, we also do Youth Vision Zero programming throughout uh, the area, as well as, uh, you know, we push to expand the uh, bike and uh, trail network uh, throughout the region uh, until we're finished with that. Um, and, you know, I had the pleasure of working, and I'll talk a little bit more about it in detail later, but I had the pleasure of working with uh, Howard University. Uh, we developed a crash tracker uh, we also work with a Safe Routes partnership as well. I'm really excited about the tool because it is a crowdsourcing tool uh, for people in the region. Uh, if they are in, uh, if they see a car parked in the bike lane, uh, if they're in a near miss situation, if they're in a traffic crash, or if they see a dangerous location like you know glass in a bike lane or something prohibiting them from crossing the street, 
uh, they can um, you know, look up our web-based app and report that. And that information uh, goes directly to us. Uh, they also have the option of clicking um, something that will send that report directly to their elected officials, as well as the uh, local Department of Transportation to say, hey, something needs to be done about this particular uh, road because it's dangerous. Uh, and this is what happened to me. Uh, and so uh, we've already crowdsourced a lot of information, uh, hundreds uh, a week from residents throughout the region and politicians are uh, emailing me and calling me asking, what can we do to change that road? So it's been great. Thanks, Sherma. I'm really um, looking forward to hearing more about that tool and I have it bookmarked in my phone. So we're probably hearing uh, more on my front. Um, Jacob, how will we turn to you? Hi, everyone. I'm Jacob Smith. I'm the executive director of NOISE, National Organizations for Youth Safety. We work all across the country um, supporting marginalized young people and addressing transportation equity and mobility justice. So our young people are on the ground developing interventions to uh, focus on community mobilization, systemic change regarding transportation equity, and uh, most importantly, uplifting their lived experiences, navigating um, this deadly transportation system that we live in. Short and sweet, all right. Uh, and for the final J name on our panel, uh, we have Jessica, <laughs> turn it to you. Uh, my name is Jessica Hart. Um, I'm here as a member of Families for Safe Streets. It's an organization um, that has chapters across the country comprised of family members of, of victims of traffic violence, as well as survivors of um, serious crashes. And I, I am part of the organization because my five-year-old daughter, Allie, was killed on September 13th, 2021. Um, she, as I said, was five years old. She was riding her bike in a crosswalk at a four-way stop in a school zone, um, just a block from our house here in Brookland in the Northeast DC area, um, up the red line. And... I have a lot of opinions about many things related to traffic violence. Um, and I'm glad to be here today to talk about what it's like to live this life. And you're wearing pink? And I'm wearing pink uh, as Allie's favorite color. Wow. <laughs> um, thank you, Jessica. Well, I think that you all can tell why these folks were invited to be on this panel with their wealth of um, experience, lived experience and, and expertise in this. So um, what I'll do is I'll throw some questions out. Feel free to grab and take which ones are interesting to you. Hopefully we'll have some time at the end for some uh, questions from the floor. Um, but to start, um, how does data enable us to address um, car crashes and road violence? And, and maybe how does it stand in the way? I can say how I think it stands yeah, in the way, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is to say that I think there's a really strong focus on just the data. And a lot of my conversations in particular with the Department of Transportation, they talk about, well, there's not, there's not a need for a stop sign here. You don't need a four-way stop. The data doesn't support it. And I say, okay, but this is outside of a restaurant and a daycare. And the parents at this daycare are telling you and the teachers are telling you that you need a four-way stop. And they just listen to the data. And so it totally fails to get not only to the safety issue, but also to address residents' actual concerns. Mm -hmm. No, there's a tension, I think, with the data and the, and the community engagement that we see emerge time and time again. Um, so thank you for offering for that um, perspective. Jeremiah or Jacob, anything that you'd want to add on to that? Yeah, I think data is an incredible opportunity to um, truly paint a great narrative. Um, but it depends on who's creating that data, um, what their narrative is, and how they're engaging the community. And I think of like what it means to think of transformative research and data, and like particularly folks who are the most impacted by traffic violence, like low income, uh, queer folks, BIPOC folks, um, housing insecure folks. Um, they're not the ones that are cultivating um, our data processes. They're not the ones who are embedded in that work. And so 
Um, I think data is an incredible opportunity to paint a great narrative, but like if that narrative is not transformative for the community that it needs to serve, then it's not effective. And I think about my own personal experience, I got into this work um, as a car crash survivor, um, you know, coming back from a school trip. And that school trip, we focused on transportation safety. And immediately after the crash, coming out of my coma, everything, everyone wanted to hear my story. They wanted to use me out as a data point. Um, but it was solely focused on what they needed it for. Um, and many years later, I realized, wow, I'm being used <laughs> for uh, traffic violence that doesn't even take into account my entire lived experience as someone who's disabled, as someone who's black and queer. Um, instead, someone's just like, yeah, you were involved in a you know, DUI crash and we're gonna use that. And so I think it's like, how do we leverage the lived experiences, people's full lived experience, and allow them to shape the narrative that can truly have an impact on ending road traffic violence? That's such a powerful perspective, and I, I wish Dr. Um, RN were here to talk about the, you know, as an academic, I think a lot about how academics often use data and lived experiences for their research, and that's something that I think a lot of people in academia could benefit from understanding. Jeremiah, anything you want to add? Yeah, I definitely uh, co-sign what my colleagues have said. Um, you know, my experience, uh, especially working with uh, departments of transportation, um, you know, the data could be skewed, right? If we're not being actively out there collecting data or collecting lived experiences, right? So like, for example, um, a lot of the governmental reporting tools that we have uh, are based upon who is reporting, right? So like, um, even though a lot of the, uh, you know, in Washington DC specifically, even though a lot of the uh, traffic crashes and uh, traffic incidents happen uh, in majority, uh, you know, low-income African-American communities in Washington, D.C. A lot of the data oftentimes doesn't show that because we're getting it from who is reporting, right? We're, like folks who are, you know, coming from well-off communities are able to have the time and ability to report. And so, like, you just kind of have to be, as a state, just active out there uh, in the community, uh, having conversations, collecting uh, information, as well as, like, you know, really working with the community to talk about the importance of reporting, you know, uh, designing tools that are useful for folks, you know. And so one of the things we did when we designed our crash tracker, uh, you know, we didn't run off into, uh, you know, uh, rich neighborhoods in Washington, D.C. To, to get feedback on how to develop this tracker uh, because we know they're reporting. We actually went to communities uh, east of the river uh, here in Washington, D.C. Uh, we had conversations uh, at elementary school, so we talked to uh, young people around what reporting tools uh, they would like to see or find useful. Uh, we talked to teachers, uh, we talked to parents, we worked with Howard Universities and looked at some of the most dangerous intersections in uh, Washington, D.C. and examined those and went out there and had conversations with uh, neighbors who lived in those particular areas to design a tool uh, that we believe that would be, uh, be beneficial uh, to them. And so that was just one way that we went about our process and uh, you know, hopefully uh, it turns into a tool that's useful. Can I add one thing? Absolutely. So as you were talking, Jeremiah, it made me think, um, a reporter recently asked me how I was able to, to be an advocate and do this and share my story. And it was like, they thought it was some great character trait that it was in me. And I said, no, it's privilege. It's because I'm able to take time off, to take a vacation day to be here. And it's because I have a spouse at home who can help me, not only with our family and our life, but who is also behind the scenes active in advocacy. And you know, it's in part because Allie's death got a lot of attention. And it's not right that it was a little white girl who got a lot of attention, but I think it's, you know, it's the reality. And so I try to take all of that and kind of put that together. And I recognize that not everyone has the ability from a variety of perspectives to speak out. And so um, I also hope to try and shed light on other communities where that's, you know, where that's happening. Because I think, you know, ultimately it's not like some great character thing in, in my life that I'm able to do this, but it's, it's a lot of other factors. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I think, you know, that conversation really highlights how, 
data and tools can help us better understand the equity implications that Mr. Brown talked about this morning of this epidemic that we're faced with. Um, Jeremiah, one thing that you were talking about that I wanted to pick up the thread a little bit of is, you know, you talked about creating a tool for and with people who are most impacted by this. And I, I kind of wish that we could do that with not just the tools that we use, but the government processes that then take the tools and the data up. So how do you think about your data interfacing with those government processes? And this question is for, for everyone who wants to take it um, and, and what some of the challenges are with, you know, once you've collected the data, that's great, but the next step of that. Uh, I guess the, the first part of your question, how do we envision working with uh, our elected officials? Um, you know, that's a good question because uh, you know, our data is crowdsourced and then it goes directly to elected officials, goes directly to departments of transportation. And so, you know, I've uh, in the past week have conversations with uh, county executives, uh, supervisors around the region who have contacted me and said, like, what do we do? <laughs> you know, like, so like, how do we you know, what do we do for this role, you know, based upon, you know, I've, we've gotten 10 near misses in like a day from people, you know? Uh, and so, um, you know, one of the things we're gonna do is, I guess, you know, one, we wanna keep it independent from the government, you know, um, just to have that autonomy, you know, but we're gonna put out like a, a, a yearly report or recommendations for changes uh, to those particular roles. So it's, of course, like if you have data, what's data without analyzing it? What's data without research? And so, um, you know, the next step is like to essentially like analyze the data, create the research, make the recommendations, and then develop your advocacy strategy uh, based upon that. Um, and never forget those uh, stories. I think another thing is um, if people feel comfortable, if you're like getting data, especially data from people and stories from people, uh, find a way to bring those voices to those uh, elected officials, to those uh, departments of transportation. So let them hear directly from those people because they're not just numbers, you know? They're like human beings with families and friends and all of that jazz. So like another part of our strategy is to bring those stories, bring those people and sit them right in front of those elected officials, sit them right in front of those, you know, dots and have, give them an opportunity to tell their stories and get the opportunity to tell, you know, what they envision uh, those roads looking like, so, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah and I, th I think I wanna add on to that in terms of a youth perspective. So at Noise, we have young people across the country who are, you know, from community mobilization to active, actively shifting policies or advocating for policy changes around transportation equity. And oftentimes the biggest barrier is elected officials, do not believe or do not believe that young people can make the true change or are not listening to young people. And so young people are often left with data. They're like, if we don't have the data here, then we cannot effectively be seen as stakeholders engaged in transforming our transportation system. Um, and so I, I think there's a beauty in using that data and, and but, but having those stories there where young people can say, yes, this is my lived experience navigating to and from school. These are my lived experiences um, with the near misses, um, but also here goes the data in my community that I'm seeing. And so, um, I think an important part of data is, is making sure that it's accessible, making sure that it's uh, accessible to the communities that most need the information. Um, oftentimes you're reading this like, you know, I, I think about something in terms of my advocacy journey. I always think about, okay, if, if my brother or my sister or my mom and dad cannot read this, then I, I'm doing my community a disservice. Um, and so, if the data is not uplifting the lived experiences of the communities and if it's not accessible for the communities that you're talking about for them to understand it, then we are truly not having a transformative um, research or data process. Anything you wanna add? Okay. Um, so you've kind of alluded to this a little bit already in your discussions of talking with elected officials and bureaucratic processes, but I'm curious if, if you've seen in your work the way that these data collection efforts, um, whether qualitative, quantitative, have fostered or unlocked collaboration and partnerships in ways that you maybe wouldn't have imagined.
Sorry, I missed that entire question. Oh, you're good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're giving your other panelists a moment to, to think about it. Um, I'm wondering if you've seen ways that the way that you think about data or data collection efforts has unlocked or, or um, cultivated different types of partnerships or collaboration that maybe wouldn't have been possible otherwise or have opened up channels uh, into you know, cross-sector kind of discussions that maybe um, you wouldn't have been able to access otherwise. So for instance, I think with you know, Jessica, the fact that you are willing to share your story means that mainstream media is, and you know, you've talked about the privilege of that, but mainstream media wasn't necessarily talking about this as much five years ago. Mm -hmm. And the fact that you're able to put such a compelling and powerful story and face to it means that, you know, you're able to access a media enterprise that shapes the you know, narrative at the national level, which I think is really powerful. And I'm just curious if, if other folks have had anything like, obviously, maybe not like that, but. Yeah, I was gonna say, uh, that's, I'm glad you mentioned that because that was like on the top of my brain to say at some point uh, today uh, is uh, developing a relationship with the media. Uh, I think it's extremely key, uh, you know, reaching out to your local media uh, folks um, because they're gonna be the they're gonna be the ones covering this, you know. Once you've collected that data or you have compelling compelling da data, um, you know it's up to us to, to develop a compelling story, um, and we really want to make sure that we're reaching as many people as possible, and we're gonna be able to do that uh, not just through social media, but like actual traditional media as well, print media, uh, radio media. Uh, so it's up to us to. If you're on a local level, establish those uh, relationships with your local uh, media person, especially if you have a local transportation reporter. Unfortunately, we don't have many of those in the region anymore, darn it. Uh, but if you have a local transportation reporter uh, in your area, reach out to them, grab coffee, uh, and you know, just develop a strong relationship. I would say also for us, uh, one thing we're doing uh, when it comes to partnerships, we not only in the development of our crash tracker, we had obviously partnerships with uh, Howard University, Salesforce Partnerships, uh, and uh, 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 elementary school, but we're continually doing outreach. So like, if you have a crash tracker, you develop, develop a crash tracker, it's extremely important that like, you just don't sit and rest and hope that people like fill it out. You have to do continuous outreach. And so uh, we have, a, for one example, we have a, a youth uh, internship program in Prince George's County, our Vision Zero uh, Leadership Institute, uh, and our students are going to uh, other schools uh, throughout the county, giving presentation on a crash tracker, talking about it, talking about why it's important to uh, you know, develop good reporting habits at a young age. Uh, so we're not just envisioning going to schools throughout Prince George's County, but we we'll hope to go to schools throughout the region as well uh, in the next few years and just continuously year after year after year, uh, educate young people on the importance of having good uh, reporting habits. So uh, we seek to develop so many different partnerships with uh, schools throughout the region uh, in the coming uh, coming years. So, yeah, and I think I think that speaks to the ability for folks to um, have ownership of their data and have ownership of their narrative, especially for young people. Like being able to go into your own community and say, "This is." This is the tracker. This is what we can use to report. Because um, far too long, our community's research and data has been done on us instead of for us, instead of with us. Um, and so I think that's an empowering opportunity for, for young people to be able to have that ability to do that. Yeah, and on the, the side of the media, I can't tell you how many times I've heard from a reporter, oh, we have all this data and we need, we need a face, we need a story. And that's what I will often come and, and provide. Um, but another part of the story element and um, within Families for Safe Streets, so our local DC chapter, we have <laughs> stories from crash victims, um, survivors, and then family members um, trying to just get the stories out there for people so that you know, you're putting a, a face with the news article maybe someone has seen or, the data on the number of crashes in a particular area of the city. 
Um, and then nationally, Families for Safe Streets has launched a story map where all across the country you can see the photo of somebody who's been killed or seriously injured. You can read their story. And so hopefully as that grows, um, everyone here today, if you have been impacted, I encourage you to, to look for that online. Um, as that grows, those, those data points are kind of connected also then with the story, which I think is really important. Yeah, and I think one of the things that I've learned working with Families for Safe Streets too is that even in you know the DC area, it's making connections to public health professionals, to social workers, to other fields that actually do touch um, the impacts of car crashes that maybe hadn't thought of that before, but are really starting to understand how it interfaces with the work that they do. Um, we have, I don't know, maybe about 10 minutes left. Um, are there, I have some questions that I could keep going with, but I want to give folks in the audience an opportunity to, yes, I see an eager hand in the back. Love the first one to break the silence. Sure, what's your question? Um, so I just want to thank everyone. Thank you so much for being here and thinking about your perspective as it relates to creating safe for streets for everyone on the road. Um, my background Sounds like it might be. I can repeat your question out uh, after. Sure. Um, so I'm wondering, in terms of data versus narrative, um, looking at making the design of streets safer for people of all ages, all abilities, and all transportation modes, how much of it is also looking at behaviors? Because beha behaviors, especially driving behaviors, are very much a social melody, just as much as the actual infrastructure and the design. Mm -hmm. Speed is the number one issue that leads to collisions and fatalities. And people not paying attention to how they're maneuvering, how they're operating the vehicle, um, distractions. People these days don't get enough sleep anymore. I mean, driving when you're sleepy is just as bad as if you're intoxicated or just as bad as you know, taking substances while you're driving. So how much of it is also kind of, I guess, looking at preventative measures, teaching people before collisions and, and terrible situations happen that their behaviors and these designs need to change and that people need to have, um, have these different expectations when it comes to operating vehicles or interacting with such dangerous um, conditions on the road and I guess, how can we be more preventative as opposed to reactive? We're waiting for something bad to happen and then we do the policy changes after that bad thing has already happened as opposed to teaching people and doing the change in advance in order to prevent a lot of these terrible mm -hmm. collisions and the tragedies that happen. Absolutely. So to sum up, for folks who didn't hear, it's like you read my notes um, because I already had a question like this teed up. So how do we use data and lived experience, quantitative and qualitative, to both convey the urgency of road violence and to raise public awareness and inspire behavior change among road users? Would you think that is a... Okay, cool. I can say Families for Safe Streets in particular the, the, I guess, the data, I guess, the research shows that education is really the least effective tool in changing streets and in preventing deaths. And that it's infrastructure changes which force people to slow down and that it's enforcement of whatever sort that um, are the really, the big things that make an impact. Um, and that, you know, people aren't perfect. Like everyone here has probably like 
gotten a parking ticket, gotten a speeding ticket. Like I can confess I've gotten a red light or a stop sign camera ticket. <laughs> like it happens and no one is perfect, but you have like, you can't rely on the individual, even if you're addressing a whole 500 people, individuals to then take that back to their, to their daily lives and expect that they're going to really change their behavior without being forced to by something else on the street. Yeah, I, I think about, um, you know, myself, I'm a car crash survivor, was in a coma for three months and my parents still drive distracted. <laughs> like, no matter, you know, no matter what campaign they see. But I, I think in terms of being an advocate, I, I recognize that people are the experts of their own lived experiences. I say that continuously. And so, um, if you are an advocate doing campaigns or trying to change behavior, think about the experiences of your community. Like, think about the, the working class folks, like the, the three jobs, the multiple jobs that they have. Do you really think that they are sitting there focused on a distracted driving campaign that's on a radio station? Like, they're not listening to it. They're, they're just not. And so what type of measures, what type of systemic um, actions can we take to protect people while they're on the road? Um, so that they can, you know, navigate their daily life in the best way possible. Yeah, I agree with some of the things my colleagues say. I will also say some of the things, uh, you know, my organization, we, we try to do all of the above, you know, um, with the emphasis that infrastructure change is the number one thing that needs to take place. Um, you know, some of the things that DC has been able to do was, uh, we just passed a bill called STARE Act, which will require, like, if you're, you know, a reckless driver, you have to go back uh, and take your driver's education uh, course again, right? Those are good policies, right? Like, another thing we're doing is, you know, working with driver schools, right? Because a lot of driver schools instructors, like, the, you know, thankfully we pass a lot of bills, but like, sometimes like driver school instructors really don't know about a lot of the nitty gritty parts of the legislation. And so, you know, we've made an effort to reach out to driver school instructors to inform them of new legislation. And we've had a driver school uh, instructor walk. Um, and I think those are things you can kind of do. Like, it's, it's kind of difficult. I mean, we do do community events all the time, you know, like trivia night and ice cream night mm -hmm. and stuff like that to educate our drivers. But I think um, we do need to stop look, start looking at the top level, like who is educating people and teaching them how to drive, right? Driver school's instructors, right? That's what they learn. Like, young people, right? Like, how do we instill good... Uh, habits in young people uh, very early. And so I think those are maybe like the top level systemic uh, educational uh, tactics that we can use. Um, and I think also, um, I don't know if this is directly tied to education, but I think one cool thing DC is doing, and it's the first in the nation, is speed governors. You know, I think those are great, right? Like speed governors, right? Things that limit the speed that vehicles can go at just... So if you're a rec if, you know, if you're a re repeat reckless driver in Washington D.C., uh, you know hopefully the bill is fully funded and implemented properly. Uh, that's another story. But like once that happens, it hopefully happens. Uh, D.C. Uh, will be one of the first in the nation to apply speed governors to reckless drivers, which will essentially just force you to uh, yeah. do the speed limit. So shout out, y'all should probably look into that policy mm -hmm. for your cities and states. I think it's a good policy to really just force people to uh, drive the speed limit. So. Yeah. yeah, we have them. Oh, sorry. Oh, I was going to add something else. So go ahead. Oh, I'm saying we have the solutions. We have the measures to just like what DC is doing. It's not, you know, we've been spending decades on these campaigns, on this work. And so it takes that systemic education, those systemic policies to actually equitably, you know, we can't be out here putting in policies that are that are harming our communities even more. But I think the solutions are out there, but we have to be really innovative with how we address those driver behaviors. But there's also a role for the national government, for the federal regulatory entities and all of this. And in, in this case of traffic violence, it's vehicle size and weight. And there aren't enough regulations to that effect. You know, there, there's nothing that says a five car vehicle must consider the safety of, of somebody outside of the vehicle. Um, a number of other things, you know, like we're moving to EVs and those are really heavy and they're not regulating the design of the grills of trucks and all these different things. And 
if we had safe vehicles, like you could be a really bad driver, but if you drive a smaller vehicle, then you're not gonna necessarily kill somebody the way that so many people are killed every year. Thank you all for highlighting those really crucial interactions between behavior and policy, infrastructure and behavior. Um, we are kind of getting close to time. One more question. Okay, terrific. Okay. Uh, yes, sir. In the, oh. Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, my my question is for, for Jacob in particular. You mentioned that like elected officials are not listening to, to young folks. What should folks <clears throat> who are maybe older than the young folks, what should we be doing to provide uh, both for cover and I guess allyship for young advocates, particularly within this sort of pedestrian safety space? Did everyone hear that question? Okay, great. Jacob, go ahead. Yeah, I, I think first is like the recognition that most of this information is like typically gatekeeped against young people. Like we, we come to these conferences, we, we have these major reports, we do all these things, and young people are looking at us like, this is our future, this is our transportation system. Why are you not inviting us to the table? Why are you not allowing us to have input? And so I think the first step is like, you know, giving young people the or allowing them to have access to this information to make informed solutions uh, based off of their own lived experience. Secondly, um, I, I think recognizing that systemic meaningful engagement is important, something I truly advocate for. There's a difference between telling a young person, hey, distribute this campaign uh, on, you know, seatbelt usage. Like, that's, that's the traditional method. How about instead, let's work with that, you know, those young people to co-create a campaign or co-create solutions and then go to our decision makers together to empower them to uh, be informed. I think uh, the Gen Z is like, yo, get with us or get out. Like, and, so, <laughs> and so, you know, at Noise, we've seen a, 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 a tremendous shift in our audience, particularly young people who are between the ages of 21 and 26, who are like, we want to be engaged. We want to be the decision makers. We don't want to just be the beneficiaries of our transportation system. So, um, and then my last point is, is something that I truly believe. It's like young people already have the power. You don't need to give it to them. You don't need to like, you know, say that I'm giving you this. They have the power within them. Uh, your job is to ensure that they can, can uh, fully utilize the tools and resources to um, activate that power that they already have. Yeah, I, want, I definitely I want to co-sign that, and I would say, uh, you know, we all as uh, adults let's use our, our connection. We have connections to those elected officials. Let's use our connection to bring them to the young people, right? Let's bring them to the table with the young people, let the young people do their thing. You know, so like just use the all those networking and connections we're making at these events and stuff like that. Just let's bring those folks to the to the young people. I will say one thing, uh, maybe not directly connected uh, to what you're saying. Uh, they're not listen, the elected officials are not listen to young people, then let's change the elected officials. You know, I think that's something we should, uh, you know, a lot of this is political. You know, a lot, of, all of this is political. 100% of this is political, right? And it starts with politics. And so how do we hold people accountable? You know, elections. Uh, we should start like looking into that. You know, if you have 501c3, there are things you can do. You can hold candidate forums, you know, especially candidate forums uh, for young people um, to let their voices be heard. Uh, if you're a 501c4, uh, there's things, you, PACs you can do, you know, election tiering stuff you can do to really hold elected officials accountable. But I will say again that as we as advocates, we need to be involved in ourselves in local elections. You know, at the end of the day, uh, if the leadership won't listen to us, let's change the leadership, you know, and also let's encourage, uh, if they want to, let's encourage young people to run for office. You know, I think it's really important. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe time for one more quick question. Yes, over there. Um, so my company just recently implemented a community of practice for equity. And um, in studying deliverables for the year, something that we're trying to tackle is, um, I guess, the intersectionality of data, a lot of what you guys are talking about. And a part of that is how do we incorporate the different identities that minorities also have in addition to that? And how do we create deliverables around that so that that's representative of who we're also advocating for? Um, so a big part of that is like how do we um, advocate for like the LGBTQ community when a lot of the data that um, you know grants will ask for doesn't even really ask for like what gender or like sex 
much you are. <laughs> so, you know, how do we, you know, do that and also, um, I guess, integrate equity into things like workforce development or like AAM and digital twinning and like how we have like AI and digital transformation and how AI can also have those like racial biases on top of also ignoring whatever other intersectional identities people have. Um, and I love the idea of like, you know, taking people's stories and making that be more representative of the data. Um, but I guess, I don't know, maybe what challenges or what solutions have you found in order to kind of integrate that intersectional um, aspect of like data and identity and storytelling into these more like structural and like foundational aspects of transportation equity? So do we have an hour more left or just, <laughs> uh, okay. Anyone want to take a quick crack at that? I'm yeah, I think, you know, from my experience, of course, equity at the end of the day is a process, and in no way should we be trying to uplift marginalized communities and just censoring their stories, because we don't want to get to a point to where we are, um, what do you call it, like, uh, like using their stories simply just to use them. Like, you know, if there's no power there, if, if, we're, not lever if we're not allowing them to utilize their own power, then it's not, then there's no equity point within that. So I would suggest like, you know, identifying like who are the folks in the room that you're trying to reach. And if they're not in the room, how can they be in the room to leverage your process of getting that data um, and, and go from there? Because it, it would be really, disappointing to where if you're trying to reach all these different communities and trying to find that intersectionality of identities and you're simply just taking their stories. Um, I will say, you know, we collect data at noise in terms of all of our marginalized youth, whether they're, you know, LGBTQ, housing insecure, low income and all of that information. But it's also like, what do you do with it? Like, is it informing your programming? Is it informing, um, you know, if are you developing recommendations based off of that, those communities? And so I would just think through what that looks like in terms of the long-term process, instead of just trying to say, I need to reach every community. Thank you. With that, I think what we can do is give our panelists a round of applause for their really...